Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you guys so much for joining us on our live stream this evening. I'm very excited for this one. We have not had a poet yet on our live stream. So this is a first for our virtual events here at Tattered Cover. My name is McKaylee. I'm with Tattered Cover Bookstore. If you're joining us for the very first time on our live streams, Welcome. Thank you so much for spending your Wednesday evening with us. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for joining our virtual community. And if you're old hat at this, and this is your second, third, or fifth, or 15th, like me, <laughs> virtual event that you've been watching with us, welcome back. It's really due to you all, the customers and our viewers and our community that we're able to stay open. Tattered Cover actually turns 50, 5-0 in 2021. And the reason that we're able to sustain during this crazy year of 2020 and the 50 years prior is because of the community and because of you. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for being here tonight. I want to also just let you know a little bit about Tattered Cover because we found with these virtual events that people join us from all over the nation. And if you don't know about Tattered Cover, we are a local independent bookstore located in the Denver metro area in Colorado. We have four major locations throughout the area. And actually all four of the stores are open right now. So if you're in the Denver metro area, please come down and join us. You can come and shop for books for about 90 minutes or so, as long as you're wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose. You can come in, use the sanitizer and gloves we have available as well, and come and shop for your Christmas shopping, your holiday shopping, all the way around. Get that done early. November is the new December, <laughs> for sure. But if you want to stay home and stay in your pajamas or you're not able to come to Colorado, that's totally fine. Tatteredcover.com is open 24-7, and we've just launched a new wonderful promotion for our Friends of Tattered Cover membership program. We have great deals going on. Uh, the whole uh, rest of the month, actually, to celebrate November is the new December and you getting your shopping done early this holiday season. So thank you guys for that. Some upcoming events real quick. We have Denise Kernan with Neil Thompson tomorrow at five o'clock right here on our YouTube channel. And then we have Cal Kalia Yang, and she is going to be hosting her event on Friday on our channel. Final uh, piece of housekeeping information is I want to let you know closed captioning is enabled for those who might want it or need it. The way to enact that is all you have to do is hover your mouse over the screen that you're watching me on right now and there's a black bar down at the bottom. There's a button that says CC on it. And then if you click that button, closed captioning is enabled for those who might want it or need it. We just wanted to give you instructions um, so that you can use that. And now I'm very excited to introduce our author, poet, writer of the hour, Ross Gay. Ross Gay teaches poetry at Indiana University and is the author of Poetry Collections, against which Bringing the Shovel Down, Lace and Pyrite, Letters from Two Gardens, with Amy Nikahamazak. Let me do that one more time. I apologize. Nikama Amy Nikahamazak. Miksa Hamatatili. And then we have River with Rose. Ren, with Rose Renberg, Catalog of Unbashed Gratitude, and the essay collection, The Book of Delights. He is here to present his latest work, Beholding, and it's my honor to introduce Ross Gay. And he's, we're gonna have him turn on his microphone and his uh, video right now. Hello. How are you? <laughs> How are you? I'm good, I'm good, how are you? Good, thank you so much for joining us. I really, we're so excited to have you here and having you talk about your latest work, Beholding. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure, yeah. Yeah, well, I would love it if you could, in true poet fashion, we were talking about this earlier, um, if you could start us off with a reading um, to get us started and then we can talk more about the book and answer some questions. How's that I, sound? I will, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Ah, great, then I'm gonna shut off my camera and I'll come back on when you're done. Okay. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Hey, so I'm gonna um, um, start this um, reading. So um, this is about, um, um, this is a poem about, um, it's hard to say what it's about. Um, and, oh, I wanted to say, um, Amy Neju Kumatatil and Rose Werenberg. Um, I wanted, I I want to say thank you. I wrote them out phonetically, but I have a reading 
Oh, yeah. I, have a, I have a reading disability. And so I wrote them out and I practiced them and I screwed it up. I let the pressure get to me. So thank you for correcting me oh, no so that everybody could hear those wonderful poets names correctly and look them up. So thank you. No worries, no worries. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna read from this, this book um, and it's called Beholding. It's a book length poem. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk about it because it's a book length poem. And every time I, part of the pleasure of talking about it is knowing that every time I talk about it, I'm not quite getting the whole thing. Um, and and I, anytime I read from it, I'm always reading a fragment of it, which is just like kind of an interesting experience. The poem, like it looks at this, um, this move of Dr. J's, who was a basketball player from the 1970s and 80s. Um, and he played, um, when I came to become a fan, it was, he played with the um, Philadelphia 76ers and I grew up outside of Philadelphia. So that was our team. And um, um, the, the poem kind of has as a, as a kind of thread or something, um, the study of this move of Dr. J's from the 1980 NBA finals against the LA Lakers. The Lakers had on that team Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and um, um, Magic Johnson, you know, and other people. <clears throat> so it's, it was uh, sort of a great um, basketball team. And the Sixers team had like Mo Cheats and I think Andrew Tony was on that team and, you know, Bobby Jones and um, Caldwell Jones. It was an amazing team also in, the 1980, in 1980. 1983, they won the championship, but in 1980, um, they lost to the Lakers. I have a little preface in the book about who Dr. J is, um, but we can, we can, I just told you enough. Um, and if, and the move that I'm talking about is this incredible move. It's, it's this layup um, that the whole book sort of meditates on and has all of these digressions. So I'm just gonna read the beginning of the poem and then um, let that, let that um, guide something. And, it, there's a, a thing um, at the beginning I say, bound in gratitude. This poem does not exist without the work and ideas and words of many, many writers and thinkers. Among them, Amiri Baraka, Garnet Cadigan, Toy Derricott, Araceli Skirmai, Saidia Hartman, Alan Iverson, Fred Moten, Kevin Kwashi, Patrick Rosal, Christina Sharp, and Susan Sontag by which I mean the work and thinking and care and words are indebted to them and are sometimes actually there. And there's an epigraph from Christina Sharp's book in the wake on blackness and being. And the ep epigraph is to be held, to behold, beholding. And you might've noticed there's nowhere to go. The wind cutting little eddies at your collarbones and behind your ear as Dr. J drives from the foul line extended to the baseline, defended valiantly by Mark Landsberger, who in this poem, despite the doofy urge to make him so, is not allegorical, but is rather simply a hardworking journeyman ball player with decent athleticism and size and a floppy mop of dusty blonde hair got caught up in the gust sliding his size 16s quick so that Doc, after catching the ball at the elbow and taking one hard dribble toward the baseline where the dunk would usually commence, could not access the paint or the lane or the key, which is what we call the area nearest the goal, which in this case is an iron hole drawn in space and therefore implies a window. Though the key makes it also a door, which Landsberger, it seemed, was trying to keep shut. And so Doc left, he left his feet, which means more or less jumping with the ball with nowhere to go and which we're warned against by coaches from day one for the ensuing requisite stupid pass or more simply though no less stupid travel, also called walking, which the leaping often leads to. Keep your feet again and again, which makes the leaping leaving your feet sounds sacrificial. The way in certain places, certain countries or countries inside of countries, you must leave by foot with nowhere to go, which there is. And doc, you should note 
after the one dribble, clasps the ball with only his right hand without once at all in any shape or form using the left, which, among other things, friends, differentiates this move from all the descendant moves. Kevin Durant, Dwayne Wade, Steph, and Giannis, and Harden, and Kawhi. Yes, Bron Bron too, I shall not be moved. And using only one hand, which is amazing, but not yet miraculous, more a physical and therefore genetic fact, thanks Ma and Pa Irving, Doc's hand becomes an octopus, gripping the ball nothing like prey. And with that ball snugged in his mitt, Doc maybe kind of sort of thought something like, I am going to put this schmuck, the schmuck in this case being Landsberger, though do not please revert to a simplistic allegorization of the journeyman, which word I repeat advisedly, I am going to put this schmuck on a poster. Though schmuck is a word I'd be surprised to hear Doc say, and the word posterize, common usage posterize his ass, you might be thinking is a bit of an anachronism in this poem in this move, which ostensibly occurred in the 1980 NBA Finals. Though we all know that nothing happens only when it happens. We all know that nothing happens only when it happens. Emerging more in the epic, which in the NBA lasts three to five years following Doc's retirement. Neek and Jordan, Hakeem the Dream and Clyde the Glide, Barkley the Glove and, yo, remember Sean Kemp? Though Doc probably thought it anyway, visionary that he was, when will they verb what I keep doing to these schmucks, especially Bill fucking Walton? Driving from the foul line extended toward the baseline as the unsuspecting Landsberger, who did a fine job of shuffling his size 16s and not holding, keeping Irving from the key, and who must for a scant and fleeting moment have felt a degree of pride when Doc, after the hard dribble right, left his feet with nowhere to go. Billy Cunningham on the sideline, his hands on his hips, his sports coat thrown open, a few strands of hair stuck to his moist pink brow and almost smiling as Doc began sailing out of bounds over the baseline. And Landsberger, a solid leaper, skied and foreclosed the possibility of Doc sneaking a shot in this side of the basket, by which I mean dunking probably quite hard, by putting his hand against the backboard, a big door swinging shut, at which fine and commendable defensive effort, Irving simply decided in the air to knock on other doors by soaring more. Have you ever decided anything in the air? Turtling his head into his chest so as not to bash it against the backboard, flying like that, in fact, now behind the basket and backboard, and where Kareem, a good help defender, uh, wait a second, that's wrong. Kareem, one of the best defenders of all time, five-time NBA All-Defensive First Team, six-time NBA All-Defensive Second Team, six MVPs, sorry, MJ, not to mention, which means it requires mentioning, Kareem was one of those Negroes they changed the rules for banning the dunk for years from the NCAA, which is to say banning emphatic and exquisite flight, which maybe explains the wise and sort of tired eyes of Kareem, one of the best basketball players of all time, who had slid to also cut off the baseline, which he accomplished, but found himself now looking into the sky directly out of bounds, which his own suddenly unfamiliar body must have been telling him was so weird this is so weird. Maybe I'll stop there. Man, if I didn't have questions to ask you, you just kept reading that thing. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. <laughs> that was, I was delightful because hearing, hearing a poet read their work is so different than hearing it in your own head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having experienced this book, and it's just always so wonderful to hear a poet read it out loud. So thank you. I'd love to start, you gave us such a nice opening with the epigraph in this book. And I'm curious, cause you also mentioned Christine's book in the acknowledgements yeah. and how you got the title. And this is the title you finally decided on. 
I would love it if you could talk more about Christine, her book, um, and in the wake on blackness and being, and how it influenced you with this particular work. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me let me try. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, maybe I'll read, and maybe I'll actually read that part and then start from there um, in the, in the, um... It was so, like, you had such admiration for her, even, like, even within the text. It was so, yeah. that's why I had to ask you about it. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. Um, I say I was in a, I was deep in a few books as I was completing this poem, <clears throat> and one of them is Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being. I read Sharp's book, recommended by my friend Nzinga, thank you in a stretch of time during which I thought I might not finish this poem, a poem which at the time was still called Flight, one of the subtitles, by the way, in my mind and now in yours, which is to say Sharp's book reminded me before the fact that this book was called, at least one of the titles anyway, Be Holding. Had I not read in the wake, I doubt I would have finished this poem. Maybe I would have finished another poem, but I wouldn't have finished this one. The wake, aspiration, beholdenness, these all come in beholding from in the wake. Sharp's work showed this poem finally how to breathe, how to behold, and how to behold itself. It is a map to be held. Sharp writes, in what ways might we enact a beholdenness to each other laterally? And how, and she says, how are we beholden to and beholders of each other in ways that change across time and place and space and yet remain? Beholden in the wake as at the very least, if we are lucky, an opportunity back to the door in our black bodies to try to look, try to see. So, and I say, and I, you know, endless gratitude and indebtedness to in the wake for understanding this poem before I did. And I hope this poem to be a kind of thinking with as well as a thinking from and a thinking after, after as in time and after as in influence or inspiration or aspiration or breath as in beholding after Christina Sharp's in the wake, but also after as in care, like looking after. There's, um, that's all to say, deeply um, um, indebted to that book. The, you know, that book, I mean, maybe it as a central question or a, um, a guiding question that I sort of take from that book is, is this question of like how in the wake of the transatlantic slave trade, um, um, how in the afterlife of slavery, um, how <clears throat> is it possible to, um, to, I mean, witness, but also to sort of how to study the impossibly, impossibly beautiful things that emerge despite it, despite it, in the wake of it, you know, um, and the ongoing wake of it. <clears throat> so it's a question that just sort of like, I realized, oh, this poem is sort of really, um, you know, I'd read most, of, I'd written most of this poem before I'd read Christina Sharp's book. And then I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of the question of, yeah. of my poem, of this poem as well. Um, so it kind of helped me articulate even what the question was. But furthermore, there are things that she's doing about looking and about like studying. I mean, she's even like kind of trying to read images and, and stuff that felt really important. And she also is talking about breathing and breath and things that just really came into my ear in a powerful way. And I can remember actually the way that this book came to be. I was, um, <clears throat> I think it's a really funny story because I've been, writing, yeah, I've been writing it for years, you know, <clears throat> in various iterations. And at some point, you know, there was this kind of a book that I'd written back in like 2013 that a buddy of mine alerted me to was, oh yeah, that book that you thought was something else maybe became this a little bit. And yeah. I, I was trying to finish, I thought, okay, I'm gonna go to Cincinnati just cause um, it's nearby and it's a town and it's a little bit nice for me to be a slightly disoriented to sort of write and in a different place. And so I went there and I kind of hold up, I got a little Airbnb and I was working and working and working. And I was like, well, 
I don't, I don't know if I'm going to figure out how to finish this poem. Like, I don't know if I'm going to do it. And then I sat down at this little coffee shop and it, it was, you know, like a fine coffee shop. Um, and it was late. And there was, I remember there was like this sweet little writing group happening to over here. And it was like kind of multi-generational. They're like college kids and then like people my age and then maybe people like, you know, you know, proper elders. Yeah. And there was that going on, the music, you know, I don't know what the music was. It, it was just like, it was just an odd sort of configuration of things. The like artwork on the wall was kind of like, whatever. Coffee wasn't that good. You know? <laughs> and, and boom, all of these things, like something happened. And this quote from Allen Iverson, um, we're talking about practice. This is kind of, um, um, you know, quote of Alan Iverson's and then kind of led me to rehear Christina Sharp's meditation on beholden that I just read on mm -hmm. what is beholdenness and to hear the word beholding and beholden in a kind of way. Um, and I sometimes think, wow, if I just didn't have that terrible cup of coffee, like those things wouldn't have like <laughs> come together in my head. I'm so glad that they, they did. Like, you know, they just kind of, magic juice like you just had it <laughs> yeah yeah really really magical but and and sharp's book is like one of the books that's really deeply important to this book um araceli skirmai is beautiful poet um dear friend and but her her poem um or her book the black maria and and kind of iterations um in her book this whole long section, I have this long section that, that really sort of meditates on this photograph, which I very, very sort of accidentally in a certain kind of way stumbled upon. I was in a, I was at the WPA photos in the Library of Congress. I was looking mm -hmm. for a photograph of what 19, early 20th century Arkansas looked like, which is where my great grandfather would have um, fled the South from. Okay. Um, and I was just, I just wanted to find Arkansas. Anyway, I was stumbled upon this photograph, which, which is really, um, the, so good. it's such an amazing picture. And, you know, like when I stumbled upon this photograph, the book was still called Flight, you know? Ah, uh, no, it, and the little oh, it fits book. better now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, My marketing brain turned on, but. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But so, you know, so I'm that, that whole meditation is in conversation, in deep conversation with um, um, some of Adeselis' work. And then, you know, Amiri Baraka, his poem, And Agony As Now comes in here. Some yeah, of you mentioned that one too. Yeah, like there's just a lot of like, of the language and thinking, et cetera, like I say, um, uh, in, the, in the Bound and Gratitude before the book that, I, Kevin Kwashi's work, he has a book called The Sovereignty of Quiet that is kind of a, a mode of thinking that this book doesn't happen, doesn't even come close to happening without his, his book, you know, and on and on and on and on. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. When I read that section, it was like my, my to be read pile just grew because I rarely read the acknowledgement sections. Are you getting recommendations for other books inside yeah. of it? But when you read this one work, it's so cool to have you admit all of the other works that influenced it, yeah. you know, and that that was really such a treat with it, in, including the words inside of it. But what's funny about the title and why I asked that question first was because, again, I read the poem, but then listened to you saying it and something about beholding and the way he held the basketball and that image of the octopus came to mind. And I was like, oh, that's another connection. That was just very... There's lots of areas to it. And I'm curious because you said you'd been playing with this for such a long time and this poem, how do you know when a poem's finished? Like, how did this one finally end for you? You know, what I knew, there was a turn. There was like an arrival that I needed to, I actually needed to in the process of writing this poem, like, you know, I've never written a poem this long. I've written long, what, what some people consider longish. Yeah, poems. I have a question about that too. I'm curious about the length and how that went, but but yeah. keep going, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so like, you know, like a 10 or a 15 page poem is one yeah. thing, but uh, you know, like a whatever this is, 95 page poem, it's, it, it's, it's uh, you know, many things sort of happen probably in the course of a life um, 
for me anyway, you know, when I'm right, when I was writing that. So many things are changing all the time, but, and there were many sort of changes and changes and changes, but there was some kind of like arrival. I needed some kind of arrival, some like real, I just basically, I think maybe I needed the poem to show me all, like I knew that all this labor that the poem was doing and all this thinking with that the poem was doing just needed to like turn just something over in me that made me look differently, you know? So I feel like, I mean, in a way how I think of poems is usually like I, you know, at this point, I'm a sort of public writer. I write with the idea of an audience, um, but my, I'm always my first audience. And the way that a thing can feel like a useful thing to me is if my, the question that I sort of start the piece with either gets like, you know, clearer or more kind of lit up or illuminated or sometimes gets answered temporarily. Yeah. And if that happens, um, you know, I, and that, if that happens, that's the first thing that to me is a kind of success. And that could be a version of, of a kind of, um, of a kind of completion. Doesn't mean though that I'm, I'm gonna want it to be public. And I have mm -hmm. some poems that have sort of changed my life in the way that I want a written thing to do that, that I've not made public because they yeah, weren't really good, yeah. you know? So yeah, I just read it. I needed to get like, I needed to get to that place that I didn't know I needed to get to. That's kind of the puzzle, like, you know? Yeah. You're trying to get to something that you don't, to me, if it's a, if it's a good poem, probably you don't know you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. But you gotta get there. You gotta figure out <laughs> how to get there. Otherwise you wouldn't be writing it. You know, there wasn't some impetus yeah. to guide you through that process, whether it is a 15 page, a, a one page or a 95 page poem and, and um, but I love the way you describe that as a, as an arrival and, and taking that thought, how did you arrive at Dr. J? Like of all the subjects in the world and specifically this dunk, right? Specifically this beautiful, almost ballet like flight he had. Cause I gotta be honest, theater kid, yeah. not a sports person yeah. like at all. I think yeah. I played volleyball for like half a semester and yeah. golf, which isn't a sport. And, <laughs> and, and I didn't know who he was. So I read this book and I took your advice. Again, also being a millennial, educate yourself. Okay. <laughs> so I went and I did. Yeah. And it was so beautiful to watch. And like I watched The Last Dance and watching basketball is this beautiful, oh, yeah. you know, it was gorgeous. And then you translating it to poetry. Yeah. What made you pick him and pick this moment in particular to focus so much of your time on and create this other work of art? Yeah, you know, it's, it's so, I mean, one like sort of basic thing is that Dr. J looms very large in my imagination. Um, yeah. And partly because I was a little kid when, when, um, when he was like, you know, at the, you know, maybe not as peak peak, but like when they won the championship, I was yeah. nine years old and, very great day for me. That's so <laughs> prominent. Yeah, it's a great memory for you. It's such an important memory. And and I also, you know, I'm sort of connected in my imagination to my father who's no longer alive and sort of like the the sweetness of, I doubt that I was actually, I doubt that I was actually watching this move when it happened, I was six years old. <laughs> but, yeah, but I kind of imagine, um, cause I would watch things with my dad as a little kid and, you know, kind of be leaning against him and, um, so there's that, um, there's, so the kind of regional and the fact that he is so much in my imagination, but there's also, I, w I found myself looking, I just found myself looking at this particular move um, and again and again and again and again and again. And, um, and there was some kind of, as I kept looking at it, I was like, I mean, as I say in the poem, I'm like, why are you looking at this so much? Mm -hmm. And I was, I mean, I realized that partly I was like, he's doing something impossible. He's just, he's doing something impossible. And um, the flight is impossible and he's doing it. And um, I think that was just, I mean, Dr. J has a, 
like a bunch of moves that you, you could write a book long poem about. But this, all of the things came, you know, and then there are these other like little factors, which is that some, I've dreamt about Dr. J. I've dreamt about Kareem. Like some of these people that kind of loom in my, also loom in my imagination um, really, really powerfully. So yeah, I don't know. It's just like, That's but that okay. move, like I found myself, I found myself watching it. And then I was like, I found myself watching it in a way that I had never found myself watching another athletic thing for sure, you know? And that I found myself watching, looking at very few things actually. And I thought, well, what am I looking at? And nice. then, hmm. And there it goes. And that's how it starts. And, but I'm curious also about the research because there's, you men, there's so many, like you, you, you mentioned in the beginning, little side quests that you go on kind of in the buildup of this move, you know, did this just come from your knowledge? What was the research process like? Yeah. You know, um, I, I love, I call it, I like, to, <laughs> I like to call it like lyric research. Okay. Uh, what, is, what does that mean to you? Meaning you just kind of like, you know, I was just thinking about this. I'm, I'm writing about sports right now and I played football in college and someone one time said something to me about like, I was a tight end for a little bit and yeah. someone said like, man, you like, you know, running a route, like meaning you run your like a pattern or something to go catch the ball. And someone was like, man, you don't really run routes. You just run. And then when you get banged somewhere, you just go that direction. And then you get banged <laughs> and you run. These it's like a pinball. <laughs> like a pinball. And I was like, oh, that's a little bit like lyric research actually, because you're like going in a direction and then boom, this thing comes to you and you just follow that for a while. Oh, maybe, cool. maybe that thing will be the thing that, you know, becomes very important to the piece that you're working on, but maybe it won't. And like the, the most kind of important moment of lyric research to me or evidence of lyric research to me was that I was looking for this image of Arkansas and I found the central image of the book, you know. Um, I did not know that. I did not know that I was writing a book that was going to be in conversation in conversation with Araceli's uh, book. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, I just didn't know how that was going to go, but it was, it was a kind of research, but it was more of maybe associative, like, let's see. I wasn't like looking for anything. Yeah. Or, or the things that I was looking for, those weren't the things that I, that you put in there, yeah. Put in there, yeah. I think about this, I talk with my buddy, Sam Stevenson, who's a beautiful writer. He has this book called Gene Smith Sink. And I actually shout out uh, Sam in a, little, in a little way in the book. There's this moment where I'm talking about coaching this kid. This kid. Oh, yeah. yes, sorry, keep going. <laughs> this kid, I was like, we were doing this drill and he's like taking a dribble to the basket and layups. All the kids were taking a dribble to the basket from the corner and a layup. And I was just, you know, like kind of teaching them. And I was just blocking their shots, blocking their shots, blocking their shots. And some of the bigger kids, this is like high school kids, varsity kids, some of the bigger kids could kind of manage and get a shot off. But this little guy, whose name was Rodney, he, um, he, he like busted my, he knocked my teeth out. <laughs> He knocked my teeth out, you know, he's like this little 14 year old kid and he just had to figure out a way to get to the basket. Yeah. I want this yeah. shot. <laughs> and he was just figuring it out. And, you know, but I call him Ronnie Free. And in some way I'm calling him Ronnie Free because Ronnie Free is this jazz musician who Sam Stevenson talks about a lot in his book. Oh. Has this beautiful chapter in his book, Gene Smith's Think about Ronnie Free. But that to me is a kind of research too. It's like yeah. all of these like, you know, what does it mean for Rodney, this kid, and Ronnie Free to kind of be in the same breath in a certain kind of way? Um, what does that mean for my meditation generally? That's so, oh, I love it. It's so, it's always really fun to kind of get a peek behind the curtain of yeah. an author's process and how it's so individual, you know, for any aspiring poet, writer of any kind out there, artist in general of finding your own process. And so I love that idea of lyric research because it does have this kind of flow to it um, and style and that's wonderful. I could keep hogging the conversation and keep talking and asking questions, but I wanna have enough time to turn it over to our audience for any questions that they might have. Um, so some of you have already been very active in the chat. Thank you so much for that. So in that chat, that's right to the right of 
the screen you're watching us on, that's weird to say, but you can type in your questions for Ross, anything about beholding, the writing process, his poetry. You know, I, I probably had a dozen more questions just wanting to know about couplets and voice. And, you know, it's just very, it was a wonderful experience to read, especially for someone who's not a basketball fan. I think, well, in college, I used to like volunteer at the Bucks games. We never would watch. We just would run concession stands. <laughs> so that was like the only time I was ever in a basketball stadium <laughs> or like for Disney on ice when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> but I want to, I want to do want to open it up for questions for everyone here. And let's see. Um, do you think you'll ever write a poem this long again? It's so funny, like at this point, I, I, I mean, I'd be surprised if I did, but, it, but maybe, I, maybe I would. I'm, I'm so interested now at like the pleasure. It's, I mean, because it's deeply pleasurable for me to think, to sort of study in this kind of way, like something so, so kind of quick, a two and a half or three second move. So to look at it so closely to see how it, it just necessarily requires all these digressions in a way to help to communicate how one understands the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I do find myself, even like when I'm with the folks I study with in class, I'm like, I do find myself being like, oh, you could just, you could just write a book about that, that, you know, that little, you know, uh, like octave change or something. Yeah, I, I was thinking like idea or shift is where my head was going for a word, but yeah. You could, yeah, you could do that for, yeah, that's, that's worth a hundred pages to me. <laughs> <laughs> so next project, know. after the sports yeah. book. Yeah, 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 it might, who knows, who knows? I might be the only one who wants to read it, but. <laughs> <laughs> that could be one of your poems. You don't have to publish that one. Don't, don't make it public. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, what was your favorite thing you found in your research that didn't make it into the book? Oh, good question. Oh, great question. Was there a picture you found maybe or a conversation with others? Um, there are many pictures that, that didn't come into the book. Was there some great pictures in the book? Yeah, aren't they nice? Yeah, those and and I and you know we kind of like went through like how to what pictures we could have and what ones we couldn't have. Um, I don't know about research, but I think it's an, an interesting story that where this poem in a certain kind of way starts earlier than actually 2013. I just remember remembering in like 2012 or something. I I realized I had this experience of. My, my experience of Dr. J's last game in his career. See, like I'm a, I'm a legit fan. Like I was like 12 yeah. when, when he retired. And I remember like kind of almost crying and like going up to the little, um, the little public school, um, the elementary school next to the apartments and like shooting and like almost crying. And, um, it, was his, it was his last game against the Bucks actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was a good team, Sidney Moncrief and Terry Cummings, who I love. Terry Cummings one of my favorite players. But Doc, as I remembered it, it was like a, you know, a one point game and last second doc took a little shot from the near the foul line and he missed and that was the end. Yeah. So I had held this sort of thought with me for, and this feeling, the deep feeling of like what could have been for years. And then I was with my buddy, Patrick Rosal actually down in, uh, he was teaching at Austin, UT Austin for a semester. And, um, in the same weekend, if you ever want to look up, there's a dance. Me and Pat do this dance. <laughs> I don't even want to say that, but but that's some, <laughs> that's some lyric research for you is to go like, on this dance. Uh, I'm like, why do we not have the clip? <laughs> I know, I know. I know. Um, but I, I, asked, I was like, yeah, let's. This is early in YouTube days. It's like you know, I don't know, ten or twelve years ago, 13, 12, 13 years ago. I was like, let's look, let's watch Dr. J's last game. So we watched it and. Um, they got blown out. They lost by like 15 points. And I had spent all these years sort of, in a way, having a kind of, I don't know, romance is almost the word, like having this experience of his last game as having been like, oh, it could have been. And, and they lost, they just handily lost. And it was, but I, I started writing poems kind of about that, just sort of wondering about memory and 
understand it and stuff. Um, so that's not exactly, well, that is a kind of research. It no, is a research. It's a research yeah. for yourself and your memories and like how you interpret that. Absolutely, I think that counts. That's right, that's right, that's right. yeah. It didn't come from a library, but who cares? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that don't matter. Um, so this, um, this, this is a really great question of what advice do you have for um, young poets? You know, like maybe, <clears throat> Maybe um, read, you know, it was the same stuff like read a lot, read mm -hmm. widely, read um, all kinds of stuff, um, read what you love, um, think about, think deeply about what you love, you know, mm -hmm. like deeply about what you love, um, study what you love. Um, also, like a kind of a, a pleasurable thing is, I think, is to really try to. Um, write from questions you know i think as a young like writer that. my experience as a young writer um was often to or and now too is to sometimes to write from a kind of position of authority and mm -hmm. and a position of knowledge or knowing and i think there's something i mean to me it's there's a kind of ethical part of it but there's also just like also like just a what's well, a kind of ethics of curiosity? Like, what does it mean if you um, you write out of not knowing and you're writing toward, you're writing through a kind of mystery as opposed to writing to tell, tell you know, to proclaim or something like that. Um, I, I think, think that's excellent because it reflects on what you said earlier about like your impetus of trying to answer a question and, and not necessarily knowing about what this poem was going to be about until you learned it yourself. You know, you didn't go into this writing it telling somebody you you just had this sense that you need to figure it out and you didn't know what the poem really was until you read Christine's book you know and or that quote came to you with the bad cup of coffee you know so yeah. it shows yeah. in your process as well yeah that's right that's right so it is really this practice of trying to listen to what you don't know how to listen mm -hmm. for which is sort of you know sounds so sort of strange but it's sort of like you know honest honor your questions you know honor and trust your questions um that's excellent yeah. Yeah. I, um, I hate that this will be the last question, but we're running out of time here. <laughs> and, um, but I think this is a really important one. Yeah. Um, and I like that it was asked, um, what did you learn about yourself in the process of writing this poem? <clears throat> um, probably a lot, because it took a long time. <laughs> Yeah, probably a lot, probably a lot, but I do feel like the poem, it asks many questions and, and, and one of the questions I think it asks really well, ultimately, for me, it helps me think about it really well, is like how, is really this question of how, how, how we witness the world makes the world. You know, and how witness itself is a kind of poetic process, practice. You know, okay. witness or poetry, poesis, the Greek root of poetry means to make. And I've been thinking a lot about that lately, like that the, the way that we witness is itself a kind of making, you know, the ways that we witness and to what ends maybe we witness or, or why, you know, why we witness, how we witness. Mm -hmm. um, and that feels like a really important question that I'm still like sort of turning over, constantly turning over in my head, but it's a question that I feel like the process of writing this book um, helped, me, helped me to sort of formulate better. <clears throat> I think there's also this, it also kind of spun me into this other question or understanding, which is, you know, which is in conversation with lots of other people, but like, Mm -hmm. that, you know, in the process of writing this poem, I sort of describe the move and I connect the move to these, these sort of instances of care in my own life and these instances yeah. of flight and these instances of holding and, um, and that the reaching, the reaching um, toward each other is, is, is the reason to be alive, you know, the reaching toward each other is the reason to be alive. And I feel like that writing this poem uh, kind of helped me 
articulate that as a as a sense i think i i think that's such a wonderful note to end on as well just the idea of talking about reaching for one another and and this idea of reaching for one another and then the end goal of being to hold one another and, and to connect yeah. um you know and going back to what you said very early on and it's in the book about this idea of um care you know and how it's to care for and to care after i think you say yeah. Yeah. um yeah. and that you get that really big you get that sense so well in this book and i'm there's a, i have a personal thank you and i'm sure anybody else who's read this poem so far is just like i learned so much also about basketball which i never thought ever <laughs> it's not my thing <laughs> so but it was really interesting and so thank you for that. And thank you for this conversation and the exploration. Thank you for this gift you've given us. And I, I, I'm sure that I'm not alone in saying that we all look forward to what else you, we will be blessed enough that you share with the public. Um, so thank you on that. I wanna give you a, you know, a, a minute or so to you remind people who you are about the book and anything else you wanna to add to close us out here. Yeah, so I'm Ross Gruske. The book I read from today, it's called Beholding and uh, University of Pittsburgh Press published it. Um, I'm so grateful to the Tatter cover, you know, for your beautiful work and the good, you know, just, you know, these bookstores and communities, um, man, to me, they mean, they mean the world. They mean the world. So I'm just like grateful to you all for what you all do. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, I forgot on the list here. Did you have one more reading? Did you want to do another little short part? Or, I mean, we're almost right at time, but it's up to you. <laughs> Be like, okay. It's okay. We're yeah. good. We, That's you know what? If you missed it, when this video ends, go back to the beginning and read the thing that, <laughs> as he reads the whole first couple part. He gave us a beautiful long reading at the beginning. So um, <laughs> I, I want to, again, just say thank you. And there's a lot of people saying thank you in the chat and sending hearts and stuff now too. So um, I'm not alone in that and, and that gratitude. Um, so thank you again, Ross, for joining us. My name is McKaylee. I'm a Tattered Cover bookstore and you can order copies of Be Holding at tatteredcover.com or come in to the store and get some when we order more because we're out. <laughs> we noticed we had sold out all our copies because I tried to find one to hold up today and I was like, man, <laughs> we're on order and you can order them online for us at tatteredcover.com. Ross, if you'll stay on here for just a minute while I close this out. Um, once again, just thank you guys for your continued support. Please continue to shop locally. For a lot of you around the nation right now, it's dinner time. Maybe order from a local mom and pop restaurant. You know, our communities are really staying alive right now thanks to you and staying strong. So thank you for that. Um, and once again, you all, my name is McKaylee, the Tattered Cover Bookstore, and this has been Ross Gay with Be Holding. Stay safe, everyone, and happy reading. Bye. And we're out. All right. Thank you.